Let's begin with a leader's discussion on next-gen mobility, software-defined vehicles, where we will talk about, and our speaker for this session, I beg your pardon, uh, for this leader's discussion is Sachin Lawande, President and CEO, Vistion Corporation. Sachin also serves on Vistion's board of directors. He is considered one of the foremost technology and business thought leaders in automotive original equipment electronics industry. Throughout his career, he has championed the need for suppliers of automotive cockpit electronics to meet the demands of the connected car era and ultimately autonomous vehicles. Moderating the talk is uh, Regu Ayaswamy, Senior Vice President, IoT and Digital Engineering, Data Consultancy Services. In this role, Regu uh, lends direction to the world's uh, leading companies as they transform into connected digital enterprises poised for growth in the business 4.0 era. Rego partners with global business leaders to help them unlock new opportunities and revenue models by harnessing the combined power of IoT and emerging digital technologies. Pleasure to have you here with us. Over to you, Rego. Thank you, Justin. I'm very happy to join this panel on next-gen mobility on software-defined vehicle NASCOM Engineering and Design Summit. I'm excited to have Sachin Lavande, CEO of Vistion, as a panelist with me here to discuss on this software-defined vehicle. As you all know, software-defined vehicles, especially we call that as SDV, describes vehicle features and functions that are primarily enabled through software. Traditionally in the past, many of the features that automotive companies try to bring is through improvements and as well as incremental additions in hardware. But today with the advent of autonomous cars, connected cars, and also electrification, software plays a prominent and central role in the vehicle features and the customer experience. We see that some of the premium cars today that come out in the market carry more than 150 million lines of code software inside the vehicle and with hundreds of uh, electronic control units. The car has become a high performance computer on wheels today. So it's a very interesting transformation that is happening in the entire automotive industry. I'm very, very excited about this topic. We have seen that uh, across our customer segments and our uh, ecosystem from chip vendors to tier one companies to OEMs adopting to this software defined uh, vehicle technology. So Sachin, um, it's great to have you here in this panel. Um, as you see this kind of transformation or shift that is happening uh, in the software defined vehicle, what really is the kind of push for this SDV? Is it the customers or is it the transformation of the technologies like autonomous or what exactly is the push that is taking this market in this direction? Thank, thank, thank you, Raghu, uh, and uh, thank you for hosting this uh, fireside chat. Um, and I should also start by thanking Kishore Patil, who first reached out to me about this event a few weeks ago. It's really great to be part of, of this event and happy to share my thoughts on how the automotive industry in general uh, is, is evolving and the role of software within it. Um, as you mentioned, cars today have uh, literally tens, in some cases, even more than a hundred electronic control units uh, and running a lot of software across all of these ECUs. Now this change has occurred over the last, I would say 10 to 15 years. And I was really lucky to have a ringside seat to this whole uh, evolution of the automotive industry uh, because around about the time I really started to get engaged in it. My background prior to that was in telecom data com. And so many of the things that were happening in that part of the industry were uh, also coming into automotive. I would say though that our automotive industry has seen more change in the last 10 years than maybe in the 50 years prior to that when it comes to technology and software. Now, the ECUs themselves, okay, a, a luxury car may have uh, over 100 ECUs. You mentioned 150. Yes, that is the number in the very high end. But even in a more mid-segment mass market vehicle, you find 50 ECUs and above. And they are running 
millions of lines of code. And so we have all heard about it, but I do not believe everyone has really fully appreciated the scale and uh, the sort of the complexity of this software. This ECUs that we talk about and the software that's running on them are not a homogeneous uh, you know, device. Uh, and, and in many ways, the car reflects more a network of devices than a single device. And, and in that sense, it is actually, in my opinion, a lot more complex than what most people realize. We often compare the car and say it's a mobile device on wheels. In reality, it's your whole enterprise network on wheels. Multiple devices running different operating systems, different functionality, but it has got to all work seamlessly like one unit. And that's what makes modern vehicles very difficult to engineer and build. And you often hear about recalls that uh, car OEMs announce to fix issues that are found in the, in, in the field. Now, why, why is this the case? Some ECUs, such as engine control units or brake control ECUs, obviously uh, from the application itself, uh, have to be designed with a very high degree of fault tolerance. Otherwise, any issue there can have catastrophic consequences. So the hardware and software that's used to build them are very different than, say, infotainment ECU, which is more there for comfort and convenience. And there, the whole you know, advent of cloud and connected services has had a major impact on it. So this diversity of technologies and the different skill sets that are required which, by the way, over time, some automotive-specific technologies have emerged both in hardware and software. The, this is what makes this whole area a very fascinating area uh, with a lot of promise in terms of how the ecosystem, and in particular, uh, our Indian um, you know, software uh, companies and, and technology companies can participate in it. But you ask the question, you know, where is this coming from? So. I believe that automotive, much like many other industries, is finally being eaten by software. You may notice the reference to I made to software you know, eating industries, which was the subject of a very nice paper by Mark Anderson. And it has, as we have seen in many other industries, taken over the main you know, sort of value proposition and how value is added. And finally, we are seeing this happen to cars. Okay. And even more importantly, with the industry shifting from a traditional gasoline diesel engine to a electric, uh, you know, uh, uh, vehicle battery powered, it is now reflecting more and more a mobile device, right? It's just a larger mobile device in use. But along with that, the point that I made earlier should be noted that it's more like a network on, on, on views. And more and more of the features are delivered through software. And this, this is going to continue. It doesn't mean that the hardware capabilities are to be you know, um, ignored or, or minimized. Of course, they're important. But the more and more of this, the features and functions will be delivered by software. And I think this is only going to uh, grow from here. We are really at the very initial days of making the car a node on the network on the internet and then bringing all of the capabilities of you know big data cloud computing high performance computing in the edge to uh, benefit you know the the drivers make driving more convenient safer right ultimately and also more accessible to more people around the world and so in that sense i think it's a, a noble cause automotive also happens to be a very large portion of all of the industries in the world, right? If you look at uh, the developed world, US, I believe somewhere between three and two, two, three and a half percent of the GDP is uh, driven by automotive. In India, it's actually even higher than that. It's about 7% of the GDP. So it's a very significant portion of the industry. And I think this is uh, uh, going to grow from here. And I, I would urge our um, members to, to pay attention to what's happening on this side and think about how to take, uh, you know, participate in the growth of automotive and software in automotive.
it's a very right observation, uh, Sachin, I, especially in the new uh, era of SDV, I think the calls are a network of uh, a lot of devices and, uh, and it, so it's quite complex. And uh, we see that um, a lot of uh, ecosystem partners are developing solutions for that. One of the observations personally I had is, is this something in order for us, for the industry to scale? Um, like the way how the telecom industry has really shaped from a standardized uh, platforms around the networks and then building apps and other software on top of the standard set of hardwares. Um, do you see how the technology part of it should evolve for that it is adaptable in a scale, scaled manner for because there is a complexity as you rightly said safety, the individual automotive uh, hardware has to be integrated. So there is a different set of complexity in a car compared to a telecom device. Um, so how does this standardization, because I feel a lot more standardization can essentially um, increase the level of adoption, reduce the effort to uh, embrace this new SDV architecture. Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think the industry as a whole has been grappling with this topic. Uh, you know, today I would say that there is some level of standardization that has uh, uh, emerged. Uh, if you look at the vehicle networking technologies, as uh, one example, CAN. CAN is a very common technology used across most of the vehicle architectures, but it is only at the physical level. Once you get into the protocols and the exchange of information on the uh, standardized CAN network, um, every OEM has multiple proprietary protocols and uh, the, the value add is, is very specific to that OEM, which makes it very difficult for the industry today to leverage the kind of scale uh, that uh, you referred to that happened in the telecom data comm space. Um, now, I believe for some pragmatic reasons, it's going to take longer in this industry for standardization to occur at the same pace of scale that occurred in telecom and datacom. But it will happen and it's going to be a gradual shift uh, towards more and more standardized compute models. Now, part of the problem is that if you look at the ecosystem, the OEMs themselves in this case, the car manufacturers, control very little of the software. Herbert Dees of VW uh, they famously said that if you look at uh, you know the OEMs, they control virtually none of the software. I will be a little more generous and say maybe they control 10% of the software. 90 plus percent of the software comes from the suppliers and their ecosystem partners. And so that's one reason. The second reason is that the industry for the longest time was focused on cost as the primary driver of you know, competitive differentiation. So the systems were designed purely with a fixed function, very close devices that were not open, that were not upgradable. And therefore the intense focus on cost created very proprietary solutions. So for this to change, there has to be a fundamental shift in mindset. Now mindset doesn't change necessarily unless there is a business pressure to do so. So right, what's going to drive that? And so what we are seeing is now this change that the traditional players in this space have to respond to, which is delivering the kind of experiences that companies like Tesla have shown is possible. Before Tesla, nobody would uh, really listen to you if you were to say that the car needs a very large display and that it has to be over the air upgradable and not just one device within the network, but the entire vehicle. Okay. Now, with the success of Tesla, okay, OTA is the uh, de facto sort of expectation, not uh, if, if not the OEMs, for sure the buying uh, you know, consumers. And, and those things are what will change this industry and, and, and make them move forward. So what I would suggest is that, you know, in terms of where we need to look at are what are those common technologies that will continue to remain as the bedrock or the foundational aspect of the overall uh, architecture of the system. And, and then we in this industry have to develop expertise and solutions 
that can be deployed across uh, the you know various car manufacturers versus the very siloed uh, approach of building technology, which has been the norm in the past. At Vistion, that's the approach we're taking. We're really building platforms. And the platform is a term that is not necessarily you know, in use as much in automotive as in the other industries, but the combination of you know, standardized hardware, standardized software, and trying to you know, bring more and more of these standardized components to meet the requirements. And the greater uh, success we see there, the easier it's going to be to bring to bear this benefit that other industries have seen of standardization and, and scale in software to the automotive industry. Thanks, sir. Actually, one of the thing, uh, Sachin, we we in India, this especially this forum, we are uh, having this panel is uh, service providers like TCS and other companies, and also uh, the captive centers here. What exactly is the role we can play in this transformation? And uh, very interesting that you pointed out that OEMs doesn't own uh, majority of the software and it's is today it's currently owned by um, suppliers and other ecosystem players. But also there is a desire we see from the OEM to take our in-house uh, some of that ownership back to them so that they can control because once it becomes a software centric vehicle then they need to have that ability to kind of change that uh, what they can want to provide and also the new you know, models like how do I do subscription models and things like that. So uh, when we kind of analyzed it we see that there is a very unique role where we can actually play a role in enabling the transformation with tier ones. Also, we can also play a role for uh, OEMs to take better control of software. Um, uh, what's your thoughts about what is the exact role uh, the service providers can play? Yeah, here is the thing that I often tell car manufacturers today, that complete control of the software uh, is, is, is a noble idea, but not a practical one. This might have been a good idea, let us say 15 years ago, okay, 20 years ago, when software in cars was still relatively a um, small and manageable uh, venture. Uh, people forget that Tesla started on the origin in the late 2007 you know, uh, or eight. And that's when they started to build the software. They did not build all of the, what they all have today overnight. And, and so with the rest of the industry not following that path and, and waiting until now, it has, uh, I think that train uh, is, has left the station. It's no longer pragmatic to build all of the various, you know, millions and millions of lines of code. Now, if you were to start now, just trying to catch up to where the state of the art is, is going to take you many years. And it's not like the rest of the industry is going to stay still, right? The industry is evolving at the same time. So the idea that they can control all of it, they have to put that aside. The second thing I often tell them is that you go to look at your organization. And if software is truly important to the future of automotive, as we believe it is, then does your organization look like a software organization? Or does it still look like a traditional manufacturing organization where software is done on the side more as a necessary evil? So th that's the second point. The third point is that if you think about quality and software, these are very difficult you know, things to come together. The more software you have, the harder it is to drive quality. And in automotive, precisely, the cost of poor quality is exceedingly high. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, this is something that we all have to understand because in many other applications, many other industries, cost of quality in software does not carry the same weight as it does in automotive. Right, so if we keep these three things in, into perspective, we can now understand that the only way the traditional OEMs can figure a path out of this is by picking the areas that they should focus on for differentiation purposes, where they feel that they truly can make an impact and be different from the others, and not to reinvent 
the wheel when it comes to some of the more foundational technologies that no end consumer would even notice, but is still required to deliver the functionality. Exactly. Right. So that's the platform that that the rest of the suppliers uh, ecosystem should provide to them. So okay. us as a tier one, as as a direct supplier to them, we are only the tip of the spear. And behind us, we have to have all of the wood that actually does the work of building all of these technologies and delivering a platform that is compelling, that has the right quality, and that is able to be kept uh, you know, up to date over time. I did not mention one other big difference that the cars have versus many of the other devices. The lifespan of the car is longer than any other device that you will own. Yeah. I just saw yesterday Apple launched the new uh, phones and, and, and uh, watches, right? And my phone, which is only two years old, seems you know, uh, old and, and almost archaic in comparison, and it's time to get a new phone, but I would never think of my car the same way. I'm driving a Tesla. I've been driving it for four years. And what's really remarkable about it is that even today, I can expect to get at least one software update a week, even at a faster pace than what I get for my phones. And through that, they have been able to extend that relationship and, and kept that vehicle and that experience fresh for me. So this notion that the car manufacturers now have to think about how to engage with their customer over a 10-year period imposes a huge uh, level of, of challenges on the underlying architecture and the software. Right? Imagine now keeping a piece of hardware out in the field and updating it and then delivering uh, you know, compelling experiences on that same hardware over that length of time. We collectively, as a, a tech industry, especially in software, have never had to do that. Where you are required to keep a consumer happy with a piece of hardware that was 10 years old. So these are the new skills that we have to learn. So that aspect of it is the, in my mind, the, the, the responsibility of the car OEM and the tier ones to figure out, but the software that has to come behind that, there's just no way that a, a, a individual tier one or an OEM can do all of it themselves. So we have to build an ecosystem. So my uh, call for action here for especially our Indian firms is to take this uh, you know, opportunity that I see emerging very seriously do not treat it as just a services opportunity, a cost arbitrage opportunity, but more of a technology opportunity to enable this long lifespan engagement with the consumer and, and enable this OEM to be able to deliver that kind of, of technology in their vehicles. Absolutely, because I think this uh, SDV essentially is providing a great challenge as well as a new opportunity and transformation that everyone can actually kind of build and uh, act upon. And uh, your uh, uh, observation in terms of that this has to be an ecosystem play and everyone contributes their part and all of that come together rather than one person doing that from end to end is a very valid observation, uh, Sachin. And uh, I'm afraid we are almost closer to the time uh, for this panel discussion and it was great pleasure to have you in this panel and um, uh, I'm you know, very, very happy you could find the time to talk to us and uh, thank you very much. And uh, Let me hand this over back to Justin. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Sachin and Raghu for that informative and insightful discussion.